As I mentioned before, the United States is the preeminent superpower, the only superpower in the world today. And then you've got a lot of other countries out there. Countries maybe like Kenya. Countries maybe like Egypt. Countries maybe like Canada. Countries maybe like Mongolia. And you could go on and on and on. Bottom line is, is that Kenya doesn't want to have problems with the United States. Egypt doesn't want to have problems with the United States. Canada and Mongolia, and as I said, these others would not either. So the idea behind bandwagoning is that these smaller countries are not going to be trying to balance any power. They're not going to be trying to balance any threat. But what they are going to attempt to do is they're going to make sure that they get on the quote-unquote winning side. And if they get on the winning side, that means that in theory, they're going to join the biggest bully, if you will. They're going to join the most powerful country, which in our purposes is going to be the United States. And when you think about this, let's turn this around. Let's say that Iran is the biggest problem in world affairs. Okay, let's say that they are. If you've got the United States and your Kenya, Egypt, Canada, Mongolia, and then if you add other countries out there that are larger, like Great Britain or like France or like Japan, if you're the Iranians, why would you ever want to go against this grouping of countries? You wouldn't. So bandwagoning basically means that almost no matter what happens, some of these smaller countries like Kenya, Egypt, Canada, and Mongolia are always going to be on the winning side. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, why do countries fight wars? They fight wars because they know that they can win. One last one that I'll give you today, and then I'll go ahead and move on. And this last one is going to be the preponderance theory. And when you're dealing with the preponderance theory, basically what you have in this world is you have one country that is considered the hegemonic power. And for our purposes in the world today, that hegemonic power is going to be the United States. There is only one country that can be the most powerful country in the world. And not only can there only be one country that can be the most powerful country in the world, but this country is going to sit at the top of the pyramid, the top of the heap, if you will. Now what you'll see on this triangle, and this does come from the text, you're going to see here great powers, middle powers, small powers, and then dependencies. When you think about great powers, you're probably talking about countries like Great Britain, probably talking about countries like France or Italy. When you're talking a middle power, you're probably talking about a country like China or maybe Russia in this example. Both of them have significant militaries. China has got an increasingly growing economy. Russia probably has a little bit stronger of a military than China does. When you start getting into small powers, you're going to start getting into more regional countries. Uh, a country like Saudi Arabia, for example, is going to be maybe a, a small power because they are going to exercise a lot of influence in the Middle East. Maybe Iran, for example, would be considered a small power. Maybe a country like Kenya in Africa would be considered a small power because Kenya, for the most part, has been very, very stable, albeit it is a little bit poor off and on, as you've demonstrated in the Hunger Articles. And then, of course, you've got your dependencies down here. These are the countries that almost no matter what, almost no matter what, are going to need to get help to do what it is that they need to do. And if you go to many of the countries in Africa, for example, they are going to be completely dependent upon help from the outside, resources from the outside, assistance from the outside. The idea behind the preponderance theory, very simply, is this. There are going to be a number of countries out there that fall on the high side of this line. And if they fall on the high side of this line, that means that effectively they are happy with their position in the world. Great Britain is not ready to rise up and challenge the United States. France is not ready to rise up and challenge the United States, nor would a country like Germany or Italy be. These great powers basically mean that if they're happy with their position in the world, even if the United States is the hegemonic power, the top dog, if you will, they're not going to want to overthrow the system because they know that they've got more to lose than they have to gain. Some folks have suggested that it's not Iran, but they've suggested actually that it is China that is the next great rival for the United States. And that seems like that makes really good sense because of China's mix of economy and China's mix of military. 
The thing is, is that with China, when you think about it, they're a middle power at this point. They've still got room to grow. They, unlike Britain or France, who have had their taste at the top, China really hasn't. And it makes sense that China might very well be a country that would end up really making a push to get to that catbird seat and to, in fact, knock the United States from it. Small powers. What you'll notice as you go down the list, you want more of the strongest powers to be happy. And you see here, virtually all of the great powers are. You see here, a really good portion of the middle powers are. And then progressively as you go down, these smaller powers realize that they don't have it that good. And these dependence, dependencies realize that they don't have anything at all. So they are actually going to be very much in favor of trying to throw this system off. Two other words that work in dealing with this are the words status quo and are the words revisionist. A status quo power is going to be interested in keeping the system exactly as it is because they've got too much to lose. Great Britain may never be number one, but if Great Britain is a country that's in the top five, why would they want to change the world power structure? Because they've got great benefits. When you think about a country like Iran, Iran is, is growing in some respects. They've got an awful lot of potential over there. Absolutely a regional power, particularly since Saddam Hussein is no longer in Iraq. But having said this, Iran has got some steps to make up. And they're probably not necessarily going to be all that happy, say, with the way sometimes that the United States tries to do things. Uh, if they decide that they want to change it around, they would be considered more of a revisionist, revisionist power. And then when you go down here to the dependencies, virtually all of the dependencies are going to be re revisionist powers because they know that they don't, or they're going to struggle growing dirt, if you will, in their respective countries. And then indeed, they're going to want to do something about it so that they would progressively rise up the pyramid. Maybe it's one box, maybe it's more. Problem is, is that as you begin to push up and try and rise, there are other countries that are going to have to slip down to the level that you once were. So with this in mind, Oftentimes, these status quo countries don't want to risk losing what they've got to the revisionist countries who, frankly, have nothing to lose. Again, if y'all have any questions, give me a holler on email, call me in the office.